Slum 30, welcome to the Art of Cat Herding, How to Manage Geeks. I'm Shiri Cabral of Palomino TV, my tweet, tweet, tweeter name, Twitter name, my, my whatever it is, my twit name is Shiri, at Shiri. And uh, these slides can be found right now there, um, and they will be there afterwards as well. I know everyone's like, oh, are the slides going to be all? Cool? So yeah, you don't have to scribble stuff down. So uh, since I figured people would probably still be walking in, but I still wanted to uh, start on time, I have some questions for you guys. Why are you here? How many people here are here because they either have been a manager in the past and kind of want to rate how, you know, kind of learn, oh, how should I have done that, or are a manager now and want to get more tips and tricks? Awesome. Okay, I my information was totally wrong. I thought the third question would be everyone. How many people are thinking of becoming a manager and want to know some tips? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of those. See, I thought everybody would fall into this third category and I was completely wrong. How many of you are here because you have a bad manager and you want to learn how to kind of manage from below? <laughs> I thought that would be kind of everyone. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, see, that is a that is a uh, check all. You know, check all that apply. Um, <laughs> I know. I don't like this story. No, no, I do, I do. So, what? Okay, good. That's why I want. What does management mean? What's your job as a manager? It is not to boss these people around and have them do your bidding. That's just one of the perks. <laughs> good, you're all awake. I like that. Uh, the man, man, being a manager means you are a team steward. Now, you may not have heard these two words together. You may have heard about project steward. What a team steward is, you are the political advocate for the team. Now, don't be afraid by the word political. What that means is it's your job to make sure that your team is seen for the awesomeness that they have within them throughout the company, right? Often in IT, whether you're operations or you're you know, development kind of stuff, you are kind of see, you're only seeing when things go wrong. <laughs> You're not necessarily seeing what things go right, and, and even as a developer when you're creating things, you know, it's not like, wow, there's that great new feature. It's like, yeah, well, finally we got that feature in, or finally we got that bug fixed. So one of the, your jobs as a, as a manager is to keep the, keep the information flowing back and forth and make sure that your managers and the rest of the company, your peers, even in managerial, the, your manager of marketing who's at your, your peer level, knows that you're doing this stuff, you're fixing this. Every bug that you fix is at least one customer now that's happy. Okay, think about that. And think about how many bugs you fix. Even the teeny tiny ones like now um, Croatian can now be seen with the right you know, dots over the right letters. You know, that may not seem like a big deal to most of your users, but to probably a good five or six, that makes them really happy because they can now you know, type their name properly on your you know, gaming site. Your job also is to provide an optimal working environment to, to your team. So to give your team the awesomeness, you know, get them to be as awesome as they can be. Um, I did not actually mean for this to be like the how to be awesome talk, but that's how it's coming out, so there you go. Um, if anyone, did anyone here go to the uh, to Ben and Fitz's uh, workshop on social socialness for geeks or whatever? They said management of weight is a way of scaling yourself. And I kind of agree with that. Um, it's a way of scaling really good stuff. Um, you know, it's not necessarily scaling yourself because everyone has good ideas. Um, and your good idea may not be the same as everybody else's good idea. So it's not about necessarily scaling yourself. It's basically about, you know, it's not that you have to go and do everything, but you're responsible for it. So you have to make sure that you are delegating it. You know, okay, well, John isn't good at this, so I like to Keisha. She's really awesome at that, so I'm going to let her do that. Um, so yeah, that's really about it. Um, it helps also, by the way, when you're doing this team stewardship, to have a regular maintenance window because we all have maintenance, and one of the things that other folks that are in IT might not understand is that maintenance is not necessarily bad. Um, in fact, planned maintenance is usually a good thing, right? It's the emergency maintenance that's down. But all they know is, well, every so often you want to take the site down for like 10 minutes. Oh, man. But if you have a regular maintenance window, and whatever regular is for you, with monthly, weekly, daily, whatever, <coughs> twice a month, if you have that maintenance window, it's, it's hard to petition for it. Once you petition for it, you can say, you know what, we're not doing any maintenance this week. And that's fine. And it might not necessarily mean take the site down, it might just mean heavy load. But if you are, if you do need it, then you don't need to petition it and you don't need to keep going to them going, we need to break things for us so we can fix things. Could you please let us do that? And then again, they're not gonna you're not gonna keep going to them with negative things. We need to take the site down. We need to do that. So that's one thing that you can do, you know, practically thing that you can do as a manager. I will say at this point that the teams that I've managed have been system teams and DBA teams. So the management I've done is ops. I don't see any reason why a lot of this stuff cannot be um, centered toward developers too. 
But feel free to like raise your hand and be like, I don't see how that would apply to developers. Can you help me with that? Um, and uh, is there anyone here that doesn't fall into either kind of an operations like DBA, SA, or development has a completely different paradigm of the geeks that they manage or think you manage? What is it? Oh, uh, science geeks. <laughs> science geeks. Okay. Well, hopefully it'll apply. You, but let me know at the end if, if it applies. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you do need to play politics. Um, I found, found that the best way to play politics is to show them your hand and basically say, here's what I'm coming with. I need this and that. I need $10,000 for this whiz bang new computer, or I need an Amazon ABS account, or Amazon AWS account so that I can easily spin up new test machines so that our QA environment can be better. This is what I want, this is why I want it. You know, all that kind of stuff. So that people see that you're not just playing politics or that you're playing a game or that you're doing stuff. I once had, a, after a manager of IT had left the company, we had our marketing people go up and be like, well, okay, so um, we had that guy leave, so can we have another uh, password on the admin account because he's, glad he's gone now? And we said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, he, you know, he said, the old manager of IT said that we could only have uh, 20 people um, on, that, on that, you know, with access to that. And I said, it's an HD access file. You can have as many people as you want. You know, obviously our, our former manager who was no longer with the company, um, he was playing games, he was playing control freak. And that's not your job. Your job is not to deny other people things until they give you stuff. So putting your cards on the table, being transparent, you know, that's another way to say that. Um, another one of your jobs is to get rid of roadblocks. That's part of team steward. If you've ever been a project steward, one of those things is to get rid of, of, of roadblocks. The bug should stop there. The stuff should not pass, pass through you. It should stop at you if you can. Now, obviously, if there's stuff coming down from above, you might need to talk to your team about it. But the idea is you handle that, they do the coding, the ops, that stuff. Your job is to make their, opt their working environment optimal. If they have to worry about, will I be able to get tissues on my desk, or do I have to go out and buy them, you know, they can't. That's five minutes they can't be coding. And, you know, that's what they're good at. So what makes a happy employee, right? So your job is to have happy employees and keep them happy. So, you know, team steward and you know, provide an optimal working environment. But what is a happy employee? A happy employee is not an employee that makes $200,000 a year. Now, maybe they do, but if you were in a really crappy job making $200,000 a year, you might work at it for like six months a year just to kind of get that money. But if you were miserable every day when you walked in the door, you would quit. At least I would. Um, I don't know about everybody here. Um, but happy employees feel listened to. They may not, I mean, everybody wants to be, all have all their ideas agreed to, and, and yes, that's great, and we'll do it. But even when you don't agree with them, if you listen to them, they will feel better. Um, they grab things that are 100% tech. For example, uh, once when I was working at a, a famous online dating site, we actually had a Cisco PIX firewall. And we had a new system in, and he's very smart, he's really, he's awesome. He came in, and he said, you know, your Cisco PIX is like a, 89% of the load that it can handle, period, and the story is going to fall over soon. And we were like, oh my god. And he showed us the graphs and he showed us the, the articles. Like, it wasn't FUD. It was true. And we were like, wow, that's a good point. Um, you know, let's go order another Cisco PIX or, you know, do that kind of stuff. And he said, no, well, what about doing this? What about having like a BSD box? Except he didn't say, what about this? He said, no. The best way to do it is have this custom built BSD box that can be a firewall. And it will be much better and it will be much more secure because we can lock it down. And we said, great. And then, you know, we talked about it. We talked about buying, um, buying a, you know, a Cisco PIX firewall versus buying a BSD box. And uh, our, our legal team said, uh, what's that going to do with our security audit? And we thought about it, and we were like, yeah, a home-built BSD box is not going to pass PCI compliance. It's just not. Even if it would be more secure, it's not going to pass PCI compliance. And I know that's kind of weird, but you know, again, nobody ever got fired by Cisco or whatever. That's just the way it is. So this was a not 100% technical issue. And this system got so frustrated that we wouldn't do what was 100% technically correct. And we went to and we said, look, we agree with you, but here's the situation. Like, we, we need to be PCI compliant. Otherwise, we can't take people's credit cards, and then nobody makes any money, and you don't get a paycheck. And, you know, we're all just here happily working away to, you know, have people meet each other. It's, you know, that's not, we do like to eat and pay our mortgages and rents. Um, and happy employees, once they're happy, they will stand by you. Um, and I will say that this employee uh, left after two months because he just, he wasn't feeling listened to, but that's part, partially because he didn't grok 
that things are not 100% tech. So there is no happy ending to every story. You know, if you don't know your questions, I'm not going to always be like, oh, you can do this and that. And, you know, sometimes the relationship isn't salvageable. If you don't have someone who's willing to work with you, that's kind of tough. And it's kind of tough when, when that ends up being your, your best producer. Um, but we'll talk, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, you know, so saying things like, I don't like it either, but, you know, here's, here's the way it is. We can't get this auditing. It stinks. It's wrong, but that's the way it is. Um, not in a confrontational way, not life is unfair, suck it up and deal, but in an empathizing way. Because yeah, you want to do the tax solution too. You want to do, you know, we would love to do a BSD box, but we just couldn't. You know, we agreed that it was the right answer. Um, and also trying to find workarounds. Like we did try to say, see if there was something where that like we could get like a BSD box, but get some software that was kind of configured and he wasn't all for that. He's like, well, but it's not as you know secure as being able to lock it down yourself. And, it wasn't really a really good compromise. Um, and if we were going to get a compromise, we were going to make sure that it was easy to get PCI compliance. Um, so, so another thing that you can do is, you know, if you are, sometimes you have difficult situations you have to present to your employees. That just happens, right? I know this deadline is, is really hard to meet. I know we're up against big odds, and, you know, we have some long nights ahead of us. We have a lot of coding to do. We have a lot of fights to have about, you know, should this be blue or black, or, <laughs> you know, should this be in the upper left corner and the lower right corner, or what's the algorithm for this, or, you know, you, you've made all your stuff, and now the DBA comes in and says, no, we have to rewrite all your queries. Um, that never happens. That's completely hypothetical. <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> um, so, you know, your job as a manager is to follow it up with, what do you need? Do you need dinners, right? I can't promise you everything. I can't promise I'll give this to you. But tell me what you need, because I can't change the deadline. I can't, you know, it's, it's got to be January 1st. It's got to be, you know, I've worked for a university before, right? It's got to be, you know, commencement video streaming has to be up. That, there's no way of, around that. If it's not up by commencement, you can't have it up the next day. It's not going to help, right? So what can I do for you to help you meet your goals? That's your job as a manager. What can I do for you to help you meet your goals? So I, I'm going to get into more practical things. Uh, the first couple slides are, are definitely like getting this, the spirit of it. So, you know, I said this is happy employees, they feel as do whatever. So how do you motivate your employees, right? That would be the big thing. Do you give them um, money or bonus or time off? Money and stuff can, can, can't be the only motivating factor because the problem with that is that it motivates them and then, then it's the status quo. So then you give them more money and more stuff and then it's a never ending cycle. And then what they end up wanting is you get the developers who are like, I build your site, I want, uh, you know, I want stock options, I want equity in the company. And then you're like, oh, but... Um, but how about, like, I'll get you an Applebee's card? <laughs> you know, like, like, stuff and money only go so far, and they can be motivating, and most of us here work not just for money, but we do work for money. You know, most of us would, would still work if we won the lottery, but, you know, we haven't won the lottery yet. Uh, praise and pride is good. Um, who here was at the keynote this morning uh, with, I think it was Zach, uh, about gamification? I was. Okay, great. A lot, a lot of people, they were just, people were politely waiting for me to finish my sentence, which I appreciate. But that could take forever with me. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Um, that's supposed to be me. <laughs> so one of the things that he put up uh, on the board was what people are motivated by, and it was a hierarchy of status, access, I think the third one was power, and the last one was stuff. And it was what people are really motivated by, you know, top to bottom. The status was the most one, and the, the stuff was the least one. And he said, and, and you know, miracle of miracles, that's the order of low cost to high cost. So I would say, obviously, I couldn't just stick that in my slides, um, you know, this morning. But, you know, status, access, power, and stuff, right? You can give them status, right? I mean, I'm not saying have an employee of a week award or whatever, because those can get kind of cheesy. But you know, give them some status. Maybe you know, talk about them, share the share the credit, talk about them in the in your meetings with your managers. Yeah, we got that bug fixed, and it was it was you know, um, it was John that really did that, and it was awesome. You know, and he did like five seconds, and it was great. Um, access. So here's something: access. You can prioritize a, a pet project for them. You know, you give them the crap work to do because you have to. Somebody has to do it, right? But give them the good work too. I know you you know, it's not quite like a carrot, but you know, it's almost like kind of being friends. I mean, you know, you have relationships with people and you do things for them and they do things for you. And hey, you know, you can say, look, I'm going to find that server for you so that you can uh, work on that, you know, SNMP monitoring system you really, really want. Or I'm going to find uh, time for you to, to build that feature that you really want for a site. You know, Google does this with the 20% time. You know, I don't think it necessarily needs to be formalized like that. But again, you can really motivate employees by 
having that kind of stuff. Maybe you can, you know, give them a machine to do whatever they want with. You know, the smaller companies sometimes it's like, yeah, you want to run your web host on, you know, you want to run Cheery.com on that. Yeah, I won't tell anyone about that. I mean, even things like that, of course, within within reason. Uh, take the team out to lunch. And uh, if you do it on your own dime, it's a lot easier to deal with because, you know, it might cost you 100 bucks. Hopefully you don't have 50 employees. That's another problem. Um, you know, it might cost you a little money, but especially if they know it's on your own dime, they will really respect you because they know that you are caring about them. Not like, okay, I have the company money and whatever. Let's do trust falls now, you know. It's, it's not a company event at that point. It's like, you're like, hey, I like you. I'm taking you out to dinner. Even though, even though you happen to be my employees. So, as an effective manager, delegate. No, really delegate. So delegate means you give somebody a task and you let them do it. Um, I have a story that uh, my mom's not here, which is great. Uh, you know, every year for Passover, you know, a lot of cooking, whatever. And this one year, my mother was like, uh, will you make the simmus? It's the stuff that needs to simmer for like hours and hours and hours. Prunes and carrots, it's great, it's delicious, whatever. And, uh, and she, you know, she had me doing that, she had me doing some other stuff, and then she like starts stirring it. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, well, you're not stirring it. And I said, <laughs> I turned her and I said, did you have me do the task because you trusted me to do it? I did say this to my mother, like in my, in my manager voice, like, or in my, <laughs> I, I said, you know, you trusted me, do you trust me to do it or not? And she looked at me and she just dropped the spoon and backed away. <laughs> because she understood, and you know, she, she was just being mom, right? You know, I would do the same thing if I saw, if I saw like a friend of mine doing that, I'd be like, let me help you with that. You're not stirring it. Um, and I do that all the time. But you know, if you trust your employees to do the job, then let them do the job. Um, you, you do need to help your employees succeed, but you also need to help them not fail. So here's the thing. If your employee's going to fail, they need to fail on their own merit. They don't need to fail because you saw them starting to fail, and so now you start to micromanage them, which made them even more nervous and failed even more, because now you're in the mix. And so did they fail because of their own abilities or because you kept butting in and whatnot? Now, again, you don't want the entire project to go down because you, you were completely hands-off either. So you make milestones, you check in, you say, hey, how's it going? Um, I have a completely imaginary and hypothetical scenario for you. Let's say I wrote a book. And uh, let's say I had a co-author, and you know we came up with a schedule. It's a big, theoretically 800-page book, theoretically uh, a, a book about MySQL because that's my specialty. And uh, we had a goal of doing a chapter every two weeks or so, maybe longer chapters or three weeks. And the idea is, you know, we had six months to write this book. We both had day jobs at the time. You know, while you're writing, I don't recommend it. It's a lot of work. Um, I recommend writing a book, just not while you have a, a day job that's you know eight hours a day, because it's a lot of work. And uh, we. We wrote and whatever, we had these chapters due and whatnot, and uh, we come to the end of the six months and we hadn't read each other's stuff yet. And uh, we, so I read his stuff and I was reading it and I was like, this is really weird, I went to go look it up, and there I am on the MySQL manual and I'm like, I just read these words. He completely plagiarized like a chapter of the MySQL manual um, early on because he, it, like, right, he, the deadline was coming up and he didn't know what to do, so he was like, well, let me just submit something and he did. I see there's something with their mouth open like that. I was like, yes, that was my reaction exactly. I was like, uh, 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 like uh, you're not like a third grader. Like, how, how do you, uh, how, uh, uh, that was exactly my reaction. <laughs> and crap, I got to rewrite it. Because I'm not going to trust him to rewrite it. Um, so, so when it happened, um, you know, that, as a manager, that should never happen, right? As a manager, you know, after the first chapter, came back, and I talked to him, I said, what, you, what, huh? you have four kids, like, you know about, like, plagiarism is bad, right? Like, don't you teach them that stuff? And he was like, well, I was really rushed, and I didn't know, and I was really worried, because it was the first chapter I was submitting, and I wanted it to be good, but I didn't, I, I wasn't, like, in the groove of writing yet, and I'm like, well, that's the whole point of having the early deadlines, and early and often, right? So, so you don't slip, and so that if you think that maybe writing a book isn't for you, maybe you should have, like, thought about after that first chapter. If that first chapter was so hard for you, that's the point, you know, and he didn't want to disappoint, he wanted the book to go forward, but you know, here we are, and I've just spent six months of my life writing a book, and the editors were like, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want this book to go forward no matter what. So I took off work, like unscheduled, you know, unpaid work days to fix it up, 
Um, but you know, as a manager, the lesson that you should take from that, and by the way, the book has no, the hypothetical, completely hypothetical book has no plagiarism in it because we, we took it all out. We used a service block, you know, goes and, and searches for things that people writing their thesis use and, and teachers use. So at any rate, the, the, there is a, a happy ending of the story, but the idea is that you should have a good enough relationship with your employees that, you know, if the writing code and the feature is good, you're not necessarily going to read their code, or you know, if it works enough for QA, that's great. But check in with them and say, how was that, or you know, what was the toughest part of that, or you know, not just why was it delayed, or, or anything like that. But if you had to do that over again, you know, what would you like to do? Maybe you'd like to work with somebody else who's done that before, or something like that. That's how you help them not fail. You know, you might think, well, that's kind of micromanaging a little, giving the, the small milestones, or now we're doing Gantt charts or whatever. But you, you, your job is to help them succeed and help them not fail. Um, and they are two different things. Also, uh, keep you, effective managers keep their promises. If you say that you will do something, do it. Whether it's, let's talk about this later, or uh, I'll look that up for you, or I'll get you some uh, resources for that, like I'll find, I'll find out someone who knows that and get a mentor for you on that issue, do it. Or I'll change who's owning the project from you to somebody else. Um, imagine if you didn't do that. So, uh, so there you go. What about effective employees? They have pride in their work. Okay, number one, and not just effective employees, effective people. Okay, I, I used to tutor sixth through eighth graders for NCAS math. This is a test that they have to take to graduate high school, and they take, you know, graduated tests throughout, and the, the only one that counts is the last one. But these were kids that were failing math in middle school, sixth to eighth uh, grade. And I found that, that it's not that they were dumb or they didn't know. Um, well, first of all, one problem is that the girls kind of didn't want to appear smart. So that was a one problem. It's middle school. Um, and another problem was the boys just, they didn't care. Their parents didn't care, they dropped them off at the Saturday session, and they didn't care. You call them up to the board and they just sit there. And, you know, so I would just, you know, when they had pride in their work, when they got something right, they, their faces just shined. I mean, when you have pride in your work, you care about following up, right? You're not going to write half-assed code. You're going to stay late to do it, right? I don't need to motivate you with money if you're like, no, I want to do it, I want to do it right, and I'm just going to, you know, how many people here have like had that, where they worked extra, they didn't have to because, dead, oh, okay, you want every one of your employees to be there all the time, right? They're not necessarily going to do that all the time. They're going to be things they don't care about, right? So they have to care about what they're doing, and they have to care about how well they're doing it. They have to care about doing a good job. Um, they're not going to do a half-assed job. They're, they are going to do a half-assed job if they don't care. Um, the problem comes that if they do care, they're more emotionally invested in it. And when you get emotional investment and geeks together, whether it's you know, science geeks or math geeks or computer geeks, they're going to fight you to the death that they're right. <laughs> um, so again, trusting your employees, this is a big one. Big, big one. You have to, in everything you do, assume that your employees are professionals. I don't care if they're two weeks out of high school or college, or 50 years out of any, you know, out of anything. Um, assume that they know their job. Assume they know how to do their job, even if you know they don't. Okay. Assume that they know how to show up at work on time, even if they don't. Because what what that shows them is if you come to them and, they, and you say, look, we, you know, I need to know where you are. I don't care if you come in at noon. But you know, when my boss says, what's the status of this project? And I don't know, and I'm like, oh, uh, you know, Fitz knows that. Let me go and find Fitz, and I can't find him. Then Fitz looks bad, and I look bad. And if you're going to make me look bad, remember, I still have the power. You know, I'm not going to be a jerk about it, but I do have the power. And maybe I won't give you that, that access to that pet project you wanted if you're going to not show up and, and make me look bad. You know, that's just life, right? If your friends screw you over, you're not going to make plans with them again. So that's not like a power dynamic bad thing. That's just life, right? So if you go to them and you say, I can't believe you're late again, and you make me think an idiot, blah, 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 they're just like, I'm sorry, whatever, I don't care. If you go to them and you say, what's wrong? Is there something wrong at home? Or is there something like, are you, is there like, you know, some medical time off because you're coming in late and you know that, you know, I've asked you to tell me like what your schedule is and I don't care what it is, but I just need to know what it is. Uh, is there something wrong? Like, was there an emergency that you had, like, a car accident or whatever? Because they're going to be like, no, I was just late. I just overslept. And they're going to feel bad that they're not acting like the professional you assume them to be. I'll say that again. They're going to feel bad that they are not acting like the professional you assume them to be. If you assume them to be a child that can't set their alarm properly, even if that's the case. <laughs> okay. 
even if that's the truth, you cannot assume that. You cannot act as, as that way because what they will then feel is, I am not a child. You cannot treat me like a child just because I work like four times this week. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what they're going to feel. If, if you treat them like a professional and they're not acting professionally, they're going to say, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'll try better. You know, and again, what can I do? Can I send you a text message when there's an important meeting? Can I send you a text message 20 minutes before you said you were going to come into work? Now, again, are you a babysitter? No. But you got to make your team as awesome as possible. And if you set a team meeting for 11 o'clock, and your best producer, right? Because it's usually the best producer is the worst employee, right? That's the problem. If they were the worst producer, they would be there, be long for this world, and it's not a problem, right? If your best producer isn't there, you know, you want their opinions. That's another way to, to motivate them. Say, look, you're really smart. If you don't show up for the design meetings, it's going to waste your time and our time and everybody else's time because we're going to start designing stuff. And you're like, oh, why did you do it that way? It's going to frustrate you. We want your opinions. Um, <laughs> So yeah, let me just check my notes. Oh yeah, so this is the number two message to take away. If you take two messages away, this slide is gonna be the number two message. The number one message is on the next slide. Um, I'm a DBA, so it's written in SQL, but I think that uh, you will actually be able to handle it. Case, the R17, when action, then result. It's really just the when action, then result, but you know, in SQL you need a case statement, so. Kind of did that. Um, you know, Ben and Fitz said this in their presentation, and I actually have gotten it before, not from their presentation, but from an awesome podcast called Manager Tools. And what it really is is when you do X, Y happens. So it's just a case statement, right? When action, then result. Not you are a bad person, you're a child. And again, these are the, the overarching messages. I don't think anyone would probably say, you know, you're a child. But when you don't show up to the meetings, to the design meetings, then we don't have your input and you give it in another way later on after maybe we, we can't put your good ideas to use. When you play your music really loud, I can't concentrate, or other your teammates can't concentrate. When you insert behavior, then consequence happens. And how can I help you change this algorithm? Right? How can I help you do this? So not, you need to change, and here's how you're going to do it. You don't tell them. Let them solve their own problems, but you are there to help them. Um, this is basically the how to discipline employees. And if you take one thing away from this, take this away. And I am more than happy for you guys to come up and ask questions you know, during lunch or whatever after the session and say, how do I address this issue? And I will get to the body odor question. How many people came here because I talked about the body odor question? <laughs> how many don't want to admit? So a few people. Um, so let's see. Yes, so uh, I did say, you know, and let them solve their own pro problems, empower them to solve their own problems. I have a friend who has a kid, and, and she posted the other day saying, uh, Sean wanted blueberry yogurt, he's three. He wanted blueberry yogurt, we didn't have any blueberry yogurt, and he was like in a tantrum. And so I said to him, you know what, Sean, if you can go to the, go to the fridge, and if, if there's blueberry yogurt there, you can have it. And you know, she didn't think this was like really her genius at the time, but he was like, oh, okay. And he went over to the fridge, and he, he picked up a strawberry yogurt, and he said, can Sean have? And he solved his own problem. Not that he had a blueberry yogurt, but I mean, that's part of like, if he feels listened to and empowered, I mean, not that your employees are children, right? But if they're emotionally invested, they, they have that thing, right? How come you won't do this, you know? Well, if you can find a way to do it, then by all means do it, but we haven't found a way to do it yet with these, these, uh, these parts, these you know, important uh, specs. So also the team solves the team problems. This happened to me two days ago. My manager, who knows that I'm a pretty good manager, said nobody's updating their priority list. So we have text documents. It's just like, what's your priority list and ticket numbers and stuff. Do you think he'd freak out? Do you think like, the team would freak out if we put project management software on top of the ticketing software? <laughs> so I said, well, you know, I don't know. But I do know that if we're not doing the priority list, why would we do project management software? Is there something we get integrated? And really, what are you trying to solve here? Because what you should do is, in a weekly team meeting, say, hey, this problem, I have this problem. In order to make sure that everyone's prioritizing appropriately and that emergencies aren't getting in the way of the work, because that we, we do operations, um, there needs to be some sort of kind of daily list of what you think you're going to do, and then we'll have our admin assistant um, look at that daily list and look at what was done against that daily list of like tickets and priorities. And, uh, and then weekly, we can like compile, this admin assistant can compile a list of what was done and what wasn't. And that way we can say, see, is there too much churn? Do we need to go to some client and say, 
you can't just I am us for these stupid little things because we're trying to do these big things for you or emergencies for other people and it's getting in the way. Are, are there DBAs on our staff that aren't prioritizing appropriately? You know, it's all this kind of stuff. Is there too much churn? You know, what's going on? And have us solve it because honestly, if we come up with the same exact idea, right, best case scenario is we come up with the same exact idea, but it's even better because now we have ownership to it. We agree to it. It doesn't have to be consensus, right? It can be democracy or it can be whatever. But I mean, we at least now have under we've talked about the problem, we understand the problem, we understand why, and understanding why can really be the, the key to everything. Not when you're a three-year-old and you're trying to explain why they have to go to bed, right? If you have a three-year-old and you try to explain the bedtime, then, and they're like, well, I'm not tired. You don't reason with them. You say, that's OK. You don't have to be tired. Bedtime is when you go to your bed, you close your eyes, and you're in the dark. And that's actually worked. I've, I've used that. <laughs> um, and it works uh, to a degree, right? Um, because you're not trying to tell them what they're feeling and what they're doing. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I have another thing. We, uh, we once did a uh, team interview. I was working with eight other system and we had a team interview for this system and we had two guys, well, it was two guys, so I'll say it was two guys, people of the male persuasion, for this position. And unanimously, we all wanted this one guy and hired the other guy. We were like, why do you bother? Why do you have this interview? Why bother? We were like, well, you just wasted our time. Eight hours of time, one hour for, you know, we were in a group one. Like, why, why'd you bother? So if you had the team solved, now that doesn't mean that we should always be whatever, but it wasn't like, oh, the guy was asking too much money. It was management thought that he would be steamrolled by the, the other professors around. And we were like, no, that's not going to happen. And anyway, um, so let's talk about the body odor issue. <laughs> and this, this is actually not just the body odor issue, but uh, any really hard issue. So the first thing to know about, you know, what, do you ha what happens if there's a coworker who smells? Somebody complains to your manager and somebody comes to you and says, Shiri, she smells. Should I like leave the order on their desk or something? What should I do? <laughs> Probably a bad idea, right? So the first thing to note is that um, you have body odor. I have a personal scent. <laughs> now, that, that's not to be wishy-washy, right? But everybody has body odor. It's just that body odor has a, a negative connotation, right? You think, oh, God, they were just at the gym or they just biked to work and did shower. So it's not a body odor issue, it's a personal scent issue. And I'm not trying to be like wishy-washy or PC here, but if I come to you and I say, you know, your body odor is really just, it's not conducive to a working environment, you'd be like, screw you. <laughs> right, you'd be like, I bike to work, would you drive? I don't care if you have a Prius, you know. You wouldn't care, right? So it's, it's a personal scent issue, because I come to you and I say, you know, um, you, know you have a very strong personal scent, and it, that could be, even be perfume. You know, it doesn't have to be what's going on. Um, so, you know, if you come to someone, yes, if you say you have a personal scent, they're going to know that basically you're saying they smell. There's no way to sugarcoat that kind of thing. And it's a hard issue, which is why this is not just for body odor, it's a hard issue. So for any hard issue. Um, this is part one. So you need, when somebody comes to you and says, Sherry smells, right, what you need to say is, what's the impact of that? Are you just telling me because like, hey, you know, the Red Sox won and it sure smells. <laughs> is that just information you want me to, to pile away? Or is that like interfering with your job? Because if you ask, is it interfering with your job, on the one hand it could be, yeah, God, she wears this perfume and it gives me migraines. Right? That's not a good working that's not an optimal working condition. Right? But if it's like, yeah, well I can like I can smell her feet and it's kind of distracting. Okay, kind of distracting is important to deal with, but not as important as I get migraines and can't work and have to go home and take sick days and whatever, right? Um, or if it's like, well, it's not really impacting my work, it's just annoying, right? Well, then you kind of have your answer there about what you should do. Um, one important thing, actually, is any complaint does not, it does not mean a call to action for you. And, and most of us who are geeks who are promoted to manager, we're all about problem solving. You come to me with a problem, I'll give you not only a problem, I'll give you 10 options on how to solve it. And they will all work, right? But sometimes when your friend comes to you and be like, I'm really depressed because you know I, I don't have money for rent, right? What they what they don't want is for you to be like, well, okay, we can fundraise, we can have a bake sale, whatever. I'll, I'll lend loan you money. What they want is like, oh man, that sucks. Here, have a hug, right? They they want to be heard, right? They want um, what do I call? It? They want uh, validation. validation. They want they want support, not solution, right? So sometimes when people are complaining, they want support and not solution. Um, 
what are the so so you ask them you get gather some specific information from them right what what is it is it like what is it kind of smell like is it like you know are they um, are they from a different culture and so what you're smelling is perhaps their diet or are they from the same culture and they're on some weird diet and so you know they're on the break from diet so now they smell weird you know are they you know keep to us or something are they you know is it like a, a foot kind of corn chip smell um, are they burning incense or candles that you know that is bothering you in, in whatever impactful way it has um, is does it kind of smell like they don't do their laundry or they left the laundry in the washer too long um, you know what what kind of like what is this kind of smell, right? And it's hard, like what exactly, and what do you think caused it? Not what caused it, what do you think caused it? The problem with the body odor issue is that most of us when we, most of us come from people that we know and that we're similar to, so we don't really smell other people's diets or whatever because you know, we're similar to them. So when you get someone that smells different, um, then we, you know, how do you know, it could be just a cultural thing. It could be the medication, right? And you explain this to them. You can say, when, they're, when you're talking about what do you think causes it, you know, you can say something like, do you think it might be caused by like a medication interaction? And you can kind of see their face and be like, oh, oh, I never thought of that. Like, I thought it was that they didn't wear deodorant. And that's an easily solvable problem. And, and they're thinking, God, this person's so lazy, they're not wearing deodorant, right? But what it really is, is it, what it really could be is it's a medical issue, right? Um, so kind of put that in there. Know what resources you have. Um, is there like a wellness program or you know a doctor or nurse that you can kind of forward them to? Like you can ask HR. I wouldn't turn it over to HR because HR's job is to make sure the company doesn't get sued. They don't really care about the employees. That's their job. and that's the job, right? But a lot of people are like, oh, HR's here to help you. No, HR's here to make sure the company doesn't get sued. And if they help you along the way, great. Um, and I love HR people, um, but you know that's their job. Just like your job is to make, but it's your job to make sure that your employees have the optimal working environment. Okay. So know what resources you can direct them to if things come up. Don't commit to specific action. Like I said, it's not a call to action, but if you don't really, you don't know what can be done until you talk to the person, you know, who it's related to. And this can be anything. It could be like gossip in the office or something. Um, and then you, you gather data and decide what you want to do. Do you even want to confront the person? You know, it could be that after you've done this getting specific information, you, you've made the person realize that, oh, maybe it's not preventable, so maybe it doesn't bother them as much if they, if they know it's not preventable, right? And ask them, what, what, what can I do? Like, if I can't, what if I can't make the smell stop? What would I have to do, you know, to make an optimal work environment for you? And, you know, it might be like, oh, move me over to, like, you know, another desk or something. But, you know, sometimes that's not feasible. And what if it's not a person? What if it's like, you know, somebody sitting next to the bathroom? Like, so what can you do? Like, there's bathroom smell. Sorry. Like, do you want to, like, rotate out everyone once a, you know, once a month or something? Again, it's possible. Um, so part two. So once you've got done all this information gathering, you just, you, let's say you decide you need to talk to this person. So you talk to them, obviously deliver privately. I don't think that's a question for anyone. Deliver it directly. There's no way to sugarcoat it. But, you know, do, do talk about personal scent and be like, you know, it's, it's been noticed, don't say who, and they will want to know who. And you don't say it, because it's not their business too. I mean, there are people that are impacted by your personal scent, um, and, you know, they've said it, that it kind of smells like, you know, cheese nuts or, you know, laundry or feet or whatever. Um, and uh, avoid, I, I say offer resources, but that's if asked, right? So you can say, um, what can I do to help solve this problem? Because um, you know, perfume can give people migraines, and there are people who complain about that. Um, and I don't want anyone to have migraines on the team. I don't want you to have migraines either. So, you know, how would you feel in that situation, whatever? You know, and try to get them to say, like, well, I guess I could use less perfume or only put it if I'm going out later that night or whatever. I mean, there are times where, you know, somebody's uh, uh, guru has told them they must burn this incense to have, like, a pleasant working environment or something. And that's a difficult thing to, to do, right? Because if you're allowed to burn smokeless incense, there's nothing prohibiting it, what's the problem, right? Or they're allowed to like feng shui their office and somebody bother somebody else. What do you, you know, you have to, again, have the team, have the person try to solve the problem. You can offer resources. If they say, you know, it's, it's my diet, I can't do anything, you could offer like, well, there are some, we do have a wellness program here, so, you know, if this is like a doctor diet, then that's one thing, but if it's something that, you know, you need, you need some help, then here are some resources and, Whatever, and you discuss follow up if there will be follow up or not. But remember that it's not a judgment. It's not you smell or whatever. It's that there's something, there's a roadblock on my team. And for once, it's not coming from you know the president or the CEO. So effective meetings, uh, effective meetings have an agenda. 
Nobody will read the agenda. This is okay. Okay? If you have a meeting where all you do is read the agenda and like, you know, discuss the agenda topics when they should have done that ahead of time because that's like your project plan or something, that's okay. Understand that nobody will do that. And you'll feel stupid and half the people, the people who do read it will feel annoyed, but honestly, that's a great meeting. Okay? Stick to the agenda. Rat holing happens. Especially people who care about the subject, they're going to find something and rat hole. Don't let that happen. Once you realize that's happening, say, you know what, we'll follow up with this at the end. Let's, we, let's get through like 95% so we'll come back to that because that's a great point. You don't have to blow smoke, right? But, you know, say that's really important. I can see that's really important to you, right? Because it is really important to them, whether it's really important or not to the project, right? But let's get like 95% of it done and then we'll fight about the 5% um, so that they do feel listened. And again, stick to your promises, so follow up if you need to follow up. Uh, write, the, write the points down. Um, if it's something where it's really just being pedantic, then call in your office and say, let's talk about this. You know, don't, if it's going to be like a, a pedantic point, you don't need to have a whole team meeting to talk about it because it's a pedantic point. But you never know because maybe that's like the 1% case in, in which that would be true. For example, if somebody says, I, I think we should put images in the database and that's really important. I can give you 100 reasons why that's the stupidest thing ever or why you're naive or whatever. Or I could say, huh, well, how would you get past uh, the fact that your backups are going to be huge? Um, and, uh, you know, we might run out of space in the database and facts are going to take longer and there's going to be a lot of bandwidth and uh, you can't really do image caching if you're taking them from the database. How are you going to handle all those issues, right? They'll either say, oh, that's, yeah, those are a lot of issues or, or whatever. Or they'll say, well, yeah, but actually those don't matter because we're only having four images and uh, they never need to be cached. And, you know, so in the 1% in the of the case where you're wrong and they're right, you look, you look, you don't look like a jerk. And in the 95% or 99% of cases, um, where you are right and they're wrong, they still respect you. And they still say, okay, you didn't treat me like um, I was bad. Is that here? A oh, working manager. Uh, who here's a working manager? Meaning you, you get your hands in the stuff, you're not just going to meetings all the time. Okay. Uh, when you're a working manager, do the same work just a bit less. Okay. The, the beauty of a manager is you get to delegate. Um, so you get to say, okay, I hate doing daily, so I'm not going to do them. You're gonna, you all are going to do them. Don't do that. You have to take your share. Um, be yeah, on the page of rotation. That's a fact of life. If you're not a working manager um, and your employees are complaining about the pager, tell them you're shadow the pager for one weekend. You get to pick the weekend, so you can pick a weekend. You're, you're at home anyway. But uh, imagine, I mean, how many people here would have a lot more respect for their, for their manager if their manager got paged when they did? Didn't have to do anything, but got woken up out of sound sleep. Right? You would, right? Because you think that they don't understand your pain, right? Just because you're looking at a lot of oh wow, you were page at 2 in the morning and 4 in the morning. That must have been a rough night. If they have a rough night, not saying do it all the time, but if you find that, that employees are really cranky about the, the paging on-call schedule, you can do this for a little bit, and maybe there's noise pages to get rid of, right? If you do the crap work, right, you're going to find some solutions to fix that, that your employees who might be really smart and could do it probably faster than you can, because they're, they're probably hopefully smarter than you. You should hire people smarter than you. Um, but they're not motivated to do it. You might be more motivated to do it. So leading by example, that's another thing. Um, if you document, other people will document. If you document things and say, oh, are you coming to me? Did you look at the documentation yet? Even if you know that that piece isn't in the documentation, they should go to the documentation first. And I say that because you're not always going to be there. There's not always going to be someone to ask. Or perhaps it's you at 3 in the morning that forgot what that important piece of information was. Uh, oh yeah, and mentoring effectively doesn't mean I'll do it. Oh, I'll do it. It's too complicated to explain. I'll do it. No, that's that's a way to hide information, and, and that doesn't help anyone. So documentation. Have one place for documentation for your team. Even if your company has seven places, have one place for you. Have an eighth place, but that's the place your employees go. Um, don't just copy other stuff though. Link to it. Right. So there's one source of information, but you don't have the redundancy. So if you know which machines you can use have changed on the ops side, your developers can still link to the ops page. Ask is it in the documentation? Have them ask each other. <coughs> you have someone who's working on a feature or working on mail or you know the bug, the bug tracking system for your tickets. You know, put that information in the tickets. We decided to you know do promotions uh, to have promotions expire and ones that go on definitely expire in all way. Uh, we decided to do that because it was easier than having two different types of promotions, ones that do expire and ones that never expire. And, you know, things, if, if somebody says, hey, blah, 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 and you're like, it's in the documentation. I don't know, it's in the, I told you 70 times in the documentation. You say, oh, I thought I documented that. Could you not find it? Now, again, like the example where you, um, 
in the 95% of the case where you're wrong or whatever, then you, or the 5% of the case where you're wrong, you don't look like a jerk. This is the same thing. If they couldn't, they, they might not be able to find it, right? You might think it's really obvious to click on ops, procedures, you know, changing the, the master database. You might think that's really obvious. They might not, because they might be looking for ops database. And they looked under ops database and didn't find changing master, right? They didn't think procedure. So it kind of gets you that out of, oh, I thought I did it. Was I wrong? Right? So if you basically say, oh, I'm sorry, you, you know, you can find that documentation, but I'd like to use seven to change times. Uh, <laughs> dude, can you, could you not find that? Or like, I could have sworn, like, you asked me that last month, and I, I you know, it, it seems almost passive aggressive, but you need to do it, and if you can get it in the right way of kind of being like, oh, I'm a space head, maybe, you know, maybe that was there. They're not going to think you're a space head because they're going to be like, no, I didn't look at the documentation yet. They're going to give you the honest truth if you, if you, you know, ask them in a nice way. Uh, checklists, make them. Same thing, it's kind of under-documenting. I didn't go to Richard Hipp's checklist thing yesterday, but it's great to have a second set of eyes. Um, and this is something you can tell when you're mentoring someone. Uh, if you have a plan, uh, first of all, a procedure that you do a lot, like say, changing a you know, master or whatever, or how to upload code or, or whatever, have a checklist so that people can follow it. Um, and have a second set of eyes. So you're doing a huge migration. I'm very experienced. I'm doing a huge migration on Monday. Um, and I have three people looking at it. Why? So I have buy-in. Why? Because if there's a step I forgot, like, oh, take a backup before you start, right? I mean, I've made dumb mistakes. I've forgotten that. It's easy to forget because it's all, oh, duh, right? And, you know, in some cases, the checklist might be, you know, uh, send email to the customer first or something. But if you miss that step, it's your fault. If you miss it and three other people miss it, it's kind of not 100% your fault anymore, right? You should get it. Um, and it's really not about blame, but you really do catch a lot of errors. And it's also a way of being um, humble, right? If you say, hey, you're my employee, will you look over my plan? They don't need to know exactly everything, especially if you're a working manager, but like they'll know the basics. If you're doing a huge migration, there are some basic things like make sure you have a good working backup beforehand, make sure you have a rollback plan, and if they ask questions, even better, right? What does this mean? Why are you doing it this way? That's great, because you can explain it to them, and they might come up with a, a better way, right? Um, and basically, they're useful to have uh, for you, not just you know at, at noon, but at, at three in the morning, or for any competent coworker if you end up having to be out sick, or you know you get hit by a bus, the proverbial bus. Um, and share the credit, and take the blame. You're the manager. That's your job. Now that's to a point, right? If somebody's really just messing everything up, you know, sometimes you have to deal with that. You have to say, look, you've been messing up a lot. You don't want to do it public, but you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's never necessary to throw somebody under a bus. Um, but, you know, you can get a real grilling by your own boss to say, like, well, why was this project late, blah, blah, blah. And again, that is a failure on your part. You should have managed it better. If you know that this uh, employee might have some problems, then perhaps you should check up on them a little bit more. Obviously, we don't have a time machine. Um, speaking of time machine, I know that I'm going a little over time. But. So, let go of the unimportant stuff, but don't let it build up either. Um, I have a friend who's here at the conference, and uh, he has a pool. And before he left, he said to his wife, uh, I vacuumed the pool, and I put chlorine tablets in it. Can you make sure that you vacuum the pool while I'm gone? But don't put chlorine tablets, because I already did that. She uh, emailed him a couple days later and said, I vacuumed the pool, and I put chlorine tablets in it. <laughs> and he was like, oh, man, I told her, and she wasn't going to do it. And, and I said, well, OK, but here's the thing. By the time you get back, like the chlorine's going to all be gone anyway. And if it's extra chlorinated, she's going to know she screwed up, right? Because she's going to like, smell like, wow, it's really chlorinated today. Must have been the chlorine tablets I put in. I guess maybe I should have done that. Um, and so like in the worst case scenario, if you're like, well, thanks. You put in the chlorine tablets. I told you not to. They're going to be upset. You know, this is not a job she usually does. You know, but if you're like, oh, thank you, right? It's, it's a little thing. It's not a big deal, right? Thanks. And if she's like, oh, yeah, but it was a little chlorinated, then like, she might come back and say, oh, yeah, did I do it right? Because it was a little extra chlorinated. But, oh, yeah, no, I put in tablets. I thought I told you that. You know, very much like it. But also don't let it build up. If there's someone that never listens to what you say, you know, again, maybe it's something to put on a checklist. If you make a checklist and they're like, oh, put chlorine tablets, vacuum pool, put chlorine tablets, you, you can say with your second set of eyes that you are, oh, no, actually, you don't need those this time. So encourage team management. If you have a team meeting weekly, it should be able to happen in your absence. The agenda should be pretty set. You know, what are you doing this week? What are you doing this week? There's no reason you have to be the facilitator of that meeting. Anybody can do it. Um, what's the status of projects, documentation? You know, this is stuff that you can get your team to do with each other, and they will. I was actually part of a team back when I was at Tufts University that, um, that we, we didn't have any documentation. We did documentation. We thought about, oh, should we use a wiki, whatever. We use HTML, because we all know HTML, and a wiki is basically HTML anyway. It's just a different tagging language. 
Um, and we would get on each other like, oh, okay, this is a mail thing, um, if, email thing. Um, you know, so I would go to the mail, mail woman and I said, you know, like, hey, Anne, you know, it, it, how do you do this? And she'd be like, oh, did you look at the documentation? And half the time I'd be like, yeah, it wasn't there. And then half the time I'd go back and I'd be like, oh, it is there. Or I'd be like, oh, I didn't look, but it isn't there, and I'd go back. And just that active step of, of doing that, even when it wasn't there, I didn't get mad at her because I was like, yeah, I should have gone to the documentation first. Um, things like on-call handoffs. There's no reason that you need to have someone give you a report that you can then give to the next on-call person, right? You shouldn't. They should kind of manage themselves, and especially you know, so that you can go away. I am a micromanager, and uh, I've not had anyone kill me yet because I think I'm an effective micromanager. What I do is I do micromanagement through ticketing systems. Um, if I want to know the status of something, I look at the ticket. If it's not updated, I'll say that. Not in the ticket because that's kind of blaming publicly. It's kind of criticizing publicly if it's in the ticket. But you know, if I have a real problem employee, I'll take a you know, I'll take a one once a week meeting. I'll say. You know, these four tickets are really important, they haven't been updated. You know, and if they tell me, well, I've been really busy, I'm working on them, and I haven't had time to update them, I'd say, like, just, just make an update, like, it's in progress. Or, you know, I've gotten this, I've got X far, but I need to do X and Y. Or come to me and say, here's the status, can you update the ticket? This is how I can help you. If you're really that busy, that, you know, you have to catch a train at the end of the day or whatever, just, like, call me and be like, I, I didn't update the ticket, can you do this? That's something you can do. Um, you know, regular meetings to, to talk about, uh, you know, team meetings to talk about ticket updates. You're not necessarily singling people out because you're singling everybody out, right? What's the status of ticket A might be yours and ticket B might be yours. You know, so even though you're saying, oh, this hasn't been touched in three weeks, what's the status? This hasn't been touched in two weeks, what's the status? That's not really um, criticizing uh, publicly because it's not, you're not singling out one person, you're singling out everyone. If you do have one person that never updates it and everyone else does, then I would recommend that. Um, and ticketing is good because then you have a lot of it when you're doing it. Sometimes firing is the answer. Problem and the employees end up working alone. And I'm sure that's how the really great coders would love it, but you know, that one bad apple spoils a bunch. So sometimes you have to go to your best coder. You know, if it means coding more effectively, right? Because 10 people can do usually a better job than one person. And if not, then make a new division. You know, make a new division of one employee and have them do that. It's not good for the team, even if they're the best uh, coder you have. Nobody wants to fire anybody, but uh, as one of my bosses said, I don't fire people, they fire themselves. It's all in your behavior. And that's how you have to treat them. You have to say, look, I'm here to help you, but if you want to be fired, I mean, that's not the way to say it, right? But, <laughs> like, I'm trying to help you and I'm on your side, and if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. So I actually happen to like this podcast, it's manager-tools.com. Sometimes they take a while to get to the point, like me, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, and it's manager-tools.com. I'm sorry I ran over time because I do, did want to respect your time, but there's still over an hour of lunch. So thank you so much for staying. Sure, the URL for the slides is uh, bit.ly slash oscon11manage. You want to get the slides, and I will probably tweet that.